delighted to host this amazing group of prolific women. We have actors, writers, producers, activists, social entrepreneurs, and these are a group of women who um, are, hi Olga, who are cultivating conversations. They are passionate about amplifying women. And um, we're gonna jump into this topic um, of narrative, of intersectional storytelling. And um, this group is really telling original stories that are captivating audiences regardless of background and identity. And um, really looking at elevating new and different voices to storytelling to achieve gender parity in media and advertising. So with that, let's kick off. 45 minutes goes so quickly here. Um, I won't be the only one asking questions once we get through a couple of questions, um, providing everyone's internet is stable. I'll ask you to uh, share the mic with me and ask each other some questions. I'm so curious to hear the questions that you would ask each other. So let's just start off introducing everyone, introducing themselves and really talking about one minute on what you do and why this subject of internet in, in, in like okay, intersectional. I want to say international today, intersectional storytelling and amplifying narratives are important to you. And I'll just start off to my left on the boxes with you, Jackie. Thank you. Well, I am very excited to be here. Thank you for creating this amazing opportunity. I think that, um, you know, storytelling is such an important part of our lives more than ever. Um, I have been uh, exposed to amazing literature since I was a little girl, uh, to be exact, since I was four years old, reading books that I didn't necessarily understand. And one of the big things that I learned and I captured was the, the way in the way that you elevate other people, in the way that you help them achieve their dreams, all of your dreams will come true. And for me, storytelling has been exactly about that. Um, I have amassed the largest collection of Latina stories in a book anthology series. And I took that very seriously. I said, how many people, how many women can I elevate? How many Latinas can I elevate with their stories? Connecting back to the source and, and reading those incredible books that shaped the way that I see life. So here we are connecting uh, in today's event, um, you know, social entrepreneur, I'm a pilot, I'm a publisher. And most importantly, I am passionate about storytelling and elevating women around the world. Well, I love this quote, taking off is optional, landing your dreams is mandatory. So <laughs> thank you uh, for that. And very, very inspirational. I see why they call you the dream catcher. Uh, Jane, on my other side, Love to hear. Uh, hello, I am Jane Tranter. I'm the CEO of a independent production company called Bad Wolf. Um, I started Bad Wolf, uh, which is a production company based in the UK, in Wales, in London, and we have Bad Wolf America in Los Angeles. I started that in 2015, having worked for many years um, in drama, both in the UK and the US for a number of different broadcasters. And I started Bad Wolf with my partner, Julie Gardner, because we wanted to tell the stories that we wanted to tell, rather than tell the stories that we were directed to tell, or we thought we could raise the money to tell. We wanted to be able to go out there and tell the sorts of stories that we felt would be Bad Wolf stories. And in particular, the stories that we like to tell at Bad Wolf have at their heart the same, they're very different, but they have at the heart the same theme, which is the theme of acceptance, of tolerance, of an embracing of those who aren't necessarily like ourselves. And that's really why I am interested in intersectional storytelling, although I don't think I would have called it that necessarily before today, um, but life is intersectional. I want to tell stories about the way we live now, whether they're through the past or whether they're through fantasy and life is not intersectional. And therefore I want to be able to present 
audiences when they look at the screen with a reflection back of themselves. So we will not be telling the story just of the white man. We tell stories, hopefully, that reflect everybody. That's beautiful. That's, you know, it is interesting when we really think about this notion of the intersectional perspective, because it's, it's really understanding the words we use the vernaculars that we're using and really how we're thinking about indicators of difference and celebrating that, that difference. And I know, Olga, you have thought a lot about that, certainly in the Latinx world and with the things that you have created and done and really creating you know, a space to really amplify the projects and provide support in that way. So tell everyone a little bit about you and, 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 and how you come to this idea of um, finding these kinds of narratives important. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Rhonda, for having us. I'm really excited to have this conversation with all these badass women. <laughs> um, so I'm one of the co-founders of the Latinx House. Uh, we actually uh, launched at Sundance Film Festival uh, this year. It feels like actually it happened like 20 years ago and it's been only like eight months. But, uh, but uh, I'm, out, I'm also one of the co-founders of She Se Puede and I'm also one of the um, co-founders of Decididas. All three like really uh, um, empowering the Latinx community, creating awareness within our Latinx community, but they mainly choose to play and decididas. It's all about women. Um, so, but for me, um, intersectional um, storytelling is extremely important because we need to, first of all, we need to acknowledge that all of us um, experience discrimination and oppression in a different way no matter what, me, me as a Latina immigrant, I'm gonna have a completely different obstacle and barriers uh, being here in the US, being in Europe, you know, just because completely different from another uh, woman of color. And I think that the understanding of that is extremely important because that's the only way that we are gonna start empowering these different communities um, across the board and every single woman. We need to understand that we are different and that we are, you know, so, so, um, so many of us. <laughs> and, and, you know, our experiences that are, different, are definitely gonna be very different because of our race our gender um, and identity, um, if we are our nationality, um, um, our immigration status, <laughs> you know, our sexual identification of like, uh, sorry, sexual um, orientation. So uh, for me to understand that and to create that and connect it to storytelling, it's extremely important because we are not we, we're, we're not gonna empower other women if we don't see it. We gotta show them, right? Um, so, so that's why storytelling for me is, is really important. And that's why I've, I've, I've helped created these three organizations um, that are so much focusing on that. Yeah, we, we often say that we have to make the invisible visible and we have to see it to be it. And uh, I think that is a great bridge, Liana, in terms of your work and how you're focusing on incubating ideas and making sure the conversations are front and center at the right places to really advocate on moving this forward and share with everyone a little bit about who you are and your work. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much again for having me. Um, Liliana Espinosa, Projects Director at NALIP, uh, the National Association of Latino Independent Producers. It's a mouthful, so we'll keep it at NALIP. Um, yeah, basically what we do is just that, right? We want to make sure that we are a platform. We want to make sure that we are a resource for these stories. Um, it's crucial for them to, to be able to have a launching pad to get somewhere, right? Both creatives and projects. So we want to make sure that we put those stories at the forefront. So we do what we can through our programs, through our events. We just wrapped the Latino Media Fest um, that we had. We 
created everything that we're doing virtual because we thought it was a really crucial year to make sure that you know struggling filmmakers uh, were able to still tell those stories. Um, so that is a little bit of what we're doing. But but I agree with all of you. I think that you know telling those authentic stories is crucial um, in telling our own stories. So I I agree with all of you on the importance of having that. So I'm hearing a sense of positivity um, and optimism, which is encouraging. Um, I, I, yeah, I'm curious, how are we doing? I mean, we're, 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 we're out there, we're doing this, but, but how are we doing? Jackie, how are we doing in this moment right now? How are we doing? Truthfully, I, in this, in this moment, I'm doing amazing. I, uh, the first two weeks of this, you know, craziness with a pandemic, I, I think I went through the five phases of grief, <laughs> uh, trying to identify what was happening and what was my place in what was happening in the context, um, running, you know, two, uh, you know, organizations, a marketing agency and a publishing house and thinking of my team and thinking of the employees and thinking of my clients, the ones that had to close due to the pandemic. And uh, it was in week three that I got this lightning in my heart. I don't know. It just, I don't even know how to describe it, <laughs> but it was like this moment, you know, I, I'm a two-time cancer survivor. I've been through, you know, I always say I've been through hell and back and almost in the same sentence, right? And, and I've been on top of the world, you know, and I think, you know, I've been here before, right? I, I thought to myself, I've been through this before. I've experienced what it takes to have this exponential resiliency in the middle of adversity. I have been in a house that had just burned down in Mexico at 12 years old and seeing 80% of my books completely burned, completely gone. And realizing in that moment, that silver lining, that light where I said, you know, I've read those books. I've read them like five times. They were my babysitters. Now it's up to me to make them come to life. So I am doing amazing by choice because I decided to do three things in this pandemic, in this situation. One, I decided to create things that I wanted to do for a long time, creating an online course related to my flying adventures as a pilot, uh, bringing it down to earth. Like how do we take those concepts of pilots into the, you know, down to earth? Second, I decided to sparkle as much magic as I could. I have, um, I fly with a little teddy bear like this one, Amelia. I have given over 800 teddy bears scattered around the world. And I, I've, I've shipped out more teddy bears, board games based on my storytelling series and books in the last six months than I had in the previous 10 years. So I intentionally decided to sparkle magic. And third, I decided to thrive. In the answer to this, we had lost several clients and I told my employees, I don't even know where I got this from, but I said, I'm not gonna cut your hours. I'm not gonna cut your salary. When this is over, I'm gonna give every single one of you a raise. And we had just lost five clients because they had just closed down. And something took over me and said, oh my God, what did I just say? <laughs> so now I gotta fulfill that promise. So again, I decided to create to sparkle and to thrive in a lot of times it's a decision right it's a decision to share our stories i've published six books this year uh, to complete 23 books published under my name and close to 100 books published uh, for other amazing stories and business and children's books and to me staying busy like that and, and creating conscious decisions is what leads me to feel amazing today in this moment well, thank you for your contagious energy and positivity. It's really, it's beautiful. It's really to see you shine your light in such an amazing way. Olga, how are you doing? I'm, I'm doing great. Um, it's kind of like a roller coaster. I, 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 I said roller coaster, like some days I'm, I'm great and some days I'm like, you know, uh, wondering where are we going <laughs> and when is this going to stop? But uh, funny enough, I've been working, I think like I've never worked in my life. And I, for those 39 participants that are like seeing and watching this, guys, I think that you're not gonna let me lie to you, but 
I feel like we're working more than before just because there is no like this car transition where like you actually are moving, you know, from one appointment to another appointment. So you just start like packing up like so many, <laughs> so many things in one day. Um, and uh, I'm six months pregnant. So I think that's mm -hmm. also of a baby girl. <laughs> so uh, another woman, another Latina um, coming, coming in. Um, so I, I, I think it's been an awkward 2020 with a lot of roller coasters, but listen, I am pregnant for the first time. I'm so happy. <laughs> no, that's the, again, just the idea of it, how everyone's planting seeds and making the most of it. And that is just beautiful too. Um, yeah. Congratulations. That's just, well, really I think that's why I fight so much about, you know, you know, the acknowledgement of intersectional, you know, the, the, because I, I know that my daughter is, even though, um, you know, it's going to be a first generation Latina, Latina, uh, Mexican American. I, listen, it's all about like trying to create a better world for her. She's, she's definitely going to have, um, you know, obstacles and barriers because, you know, you know, the cost system is, is how it's, it's been set up. <laughs> so I think we need to change that. And we need to work hard on, on all of us on, on changing this. And, and like, this is why we, the five of us are here. So we can talk to these 40 participants and, and really create awareness of, of what we need to change. Yes, yes. Um, and Liliana, how are you doing? I mean, I think I echo the same sentiment as everybody, right? It's been a crazy year, but I do think that it's a year where everybody is listening to what's going on. I feel like the distractions are kind of quieting down because of everything going on and we're able to listen. So I think it's a good place to move from in terms of, you know, what can we create now, right? So these stories are being told all over the world. And I think it's an opportunity for us to, to tell those authentic stories. So I'm optimistic about that, what, that side of it, um, making sure that, you know, that we don't just, it's not just chatter that we're hearing and then it quiets down again when everything goes back to normal. I think it's an opportunity to take uh, that, you know, a lot of these voices are being heard right now. Um, so let's, let's create these impactful stories. Uh, so I, I'm optimistic about that. Good. Jane. Hanging on in there, I would, I would say. Um, I uh, very inspired by um, the idea from Jackie of being amazing by choice. Um, and very good uh, to be reminded also that um, this has been a crazy year, but it has been a year. Um, it's been a year of a lot of shouting and will continue, uh, I imagine, on both sides of the Atlantic to be a year of a lot of shouting. But there has also been a good deal of listening going on, which is good. Uh, I have, but I, I think it's, um, I think I waver between thinking, you know what, we're doing really well. And um, actually, this is nothing. Um, and I had an I had an interesting moment on my echo chamber, which is Twitter yesterday, um, where I was reminded um, there was the usual sort of high fiving going on. Um, and I was reminded uh, by someone of these American uh, amazing British television executives in the early 1990s, these two incredible women. Uh, Sally Head and Gwenda Bagshaw, and um, you won't necessarily know them, but you will know or somewhat of their legacy. They were the women behind Prime Suspect, mm. and um, they were really, really tough, ballsy women in the early 90s when, you know, you don't really realize that as a woman at the time, but, you know, you are just surrounded by a sea of middle-aged white male faces, and these women just sort of cut through everything and were very inspirational, and created this character with Linda LaPlante of Jane Tennyson, wonderfully brought to life by Helen Mirren. Um, and I was reminded by how difficult that was 
Um, and I looked and I thought, well, you know, that's 20, 20 years ago. And now it is not difficult to put um, women in, in the center of, uh, of our television dramas. You know, there was a time when I would step forward and say, I want to make a drama about this, that and the other. And they go, yeah, but, you know, can she be a man? And literally that happened. And now you will never know if that happens. So that's all good. And then I got, as you do, I got a little kind of like reply, which said, whoa, easy, Jane Tranter, not everybody looks like you. And, um, and I'm kind of actually, you know, it's completely right. It's kind of like we, we go forward and we, you know, give ourselves a pat on the back because we are so inclusive um, these days of, of telling stories about, about women and about time too. And it's quite right that we have our say, but there are so many other forms of intersectionality and inclusivity. Um, and in particular, um, diversity and diversity of women, not just diversity, but diverse women um, of gender, obviously, of the of disability, uh, both physical, um, mental, neurologically diverse. And I think that's the big push that we still need to do in our drama. It's kind of like, yes, here's your woman and yes, here's your diversity and yes, here's your disability. But that's it all still feels very compartmentalized to me and it needs bringing together. And it needs bringing together across all different um, genres of, of, of storytelling. Um, so yes, I think we're doing really well. Um, and yes, I feel positive and buoyed up in 2020, but boy, have we still got a long way to go. Yeah, I th one of the things that I think we all have in common is that we understand that we have to really change beliefs and behaviors in order to change outcomes. That that is you know, really a clear, this idea of this question, how can we as an industry work together to help shift norms and change, you know, cultures? I think, you know, Jane, I'm going to start back with you on narrative development and characters, just the work that you've done with characters, with, you know, his dark materials and Lyra, you know, a, a young character um, who has been described to zig when everyone else zags. And then, of course, now um, in your, you know, your newest work, um, the role of um, women in, 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 a, in a masculine hyper world. And so just let's just shift a little bit to character development and the, the role that they play in intersectional storytelling above your perspective on that. Well, they're two, um, they're two sort of different pieces. So obviously his dark materials uh, is um, fantasy genre. Um, and it's an adaptation of um, a trilogy of novels by Philip Pullman. Um, and so we did two things in that. One is we took that sense of um, intersectionality that Philip had created. It's, it's very unusual to put in the heart of a trilogy of novels that aren't for children. Philip's novels are for adults that children should and could um, uh, read and in our adaptation for HBO Watch. Um, and he put a young girl um, right at the heart of it and a young girl who was going through puberty um, and put her right at the heart of a narrative where the prop all of the sort of big plot twists and turns seem to happen above her head, um, where the whole of the narrative was about a very male orientated in the main, um, pursuit of greatness and his story was about a teenage girl's pursuit of goodness. Her desire to do the right thing is the thing that ultimately saves the world in our fantasy. Um, and so we took that and we really um, uh, elevated her story in our television adaptation as much as we could. And then around that, we look for the other points of um, intersectionality, which at the time we didn't look at it like that at all, but it came out that way, I guess, um, where we look to cast in a way that perhaps isn't always reflective of how the fantasy genre is cast. Um, and that, that means sometimes changing the, gen the gender of certain roles. Um, it certainly means casting um, diverse, whereas perhaps in the original that wasn't necessarily 
um, the um, what was written. And that was really done. Again, it goes back to that point of wanting to tell an audience stories that are relevant to them and their lives. Um, and therefore you want reflected back um, your world on the screen. Um, and it doesn't really matter whether or not there is a master of Georgian College um, who is a man of color, but you know it would be much better in our lives if there was. Um, and so we cast for how things should be. Um, sometimes putting a, a, an actor with disabilities into quite a physical role, for example, because that's how it should be. Um, and so in that, we tried to, it really, it was less perhaps about the storytelling that because that was already cast in terms of the character development and more about the representation. Industry, um, the piece you reference is an altogether different story because that was a very, very um, deliberate attempt to tell a story that does not get told ever normally. Um, so industry is set in the world of finance. It's set in American bank, um, a fictional American bank in London. It's written by brand new writers, uh, Mickey Down and Conrad Kay. And it tells a story of graduates who just come into, um, uh, come into this bank um, and they are just starting out on their journey. And at the center of this group of graduates is a small young woman of color called Harper, um, who is very different from everyone else um, in that she isn't the sort of normal, um, uh, athletic, um, highly toned, um, glossy haired, uh, white skinned kind of English girl that you normally see, head of netball that you normally see sitting um, at a desk in this bank. She's a small, sweaty, uh, woman of color um, with her braids not behaving as they should do, who is working in the bank because she wants to get rich. And that's the key thing. You know, we, we never portray women in that way. You know, rich and women, it's kind of like, I'm, I'm, I'm working because, uh, not because I have to, because I, I, I've got all these children to feed. I'm working because I want to be rich because rich does not have to be a white man's prerogative. And whilst I'm not saying that that is the best value system in the world, that is the value system of many people in the world. And it is a proper reflection. And her journey from innocence to experience is a very, and the toughness with which she goes at that is, um, was a really interesting thing to unfold. And we found, and I will stop talking in a minute, but I just want to get this point over because it's quite interesting that we found as we were editing our way through um, the eight episodes of industry in lockdown and you decide really where you're leaning into which of the characters and whose story you're telling that when we pull back and we looked at the full array of what we've done in industry we realized that every single solitary one of the characters who actually um, uh, felt like um, felt like someone you would cross the work the road to avoid and definitely wouldn't want to be in the workplace with was a white man without exception and everybody else they could be flawed they were um uh, had all sorts of levels of bad to them but you would want to be in their company and they were the ones um who who were diverse in so many different ways um and that felt like a really interesting end of 2020 reflection of um of, of where I think we should be going with our storytelling in, in television drama. I like that complexity of all those things and this notion that character exploration and expectation, you know, that, that, we, can, that we can play with that and to see where that takes us. Olga, how does that resonate with you? Oh, you're on mute. Um, I, 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 as a producer, I forgot to actually say at the beginning that I'm also um, a producer and actress. And um, Jane, congratulations on all the amazing work that you're doing. Uh, that is it's really incredible. Um, and I, I, it resonates because I do feel that we need to, you know, value each, like, the voices. I think we do have a problem of, like, really allowing ourselves to listen and learn like what is like the voice of this character or the voice of that other character and somehow in our industry you know they they think that we that you know that that there's no um there's no recognition re recognition of so many different voices 
And I think that intersection, like the intersectionality of the storytelling, we really need to allow ourselves to 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 listen to these voices, to create, to to let them create their own stories. Just like Jane is saying, we need to really let them create their own stories. And there's so many stories around that that need to be that need to be tell and need to be told and. I am I, I am in in the Latinx cast. We're trying to really uplift um, the excellence within our community, but by uplifting, recognizing all these different voices that are across from the board, because that's the only way that we are going to start changing the culture narrative and opening really big doors for all kind of women, but all kind of people. Period. So um, I think it's really important uh, what you're doing, Jane, creating characters that are completely unexpected. And, and I love the fact that you're saying, you know, that, yeah, you, most of the time the women work only because, you know, because they need, you know, they need to work or whatever, but not because they want to achieve a goal or have a goal. And I think that we need to start changing that as well. Um, you know, because we do have dreams, we do have goals, we do, you know, have a lot of things that we want to do. And I think that um, another thing that I want to add is just also in the storytelling, we need to identify uh, that we are so different. So the family structure, it is different. And our communities are going to be different. And I think one of the biggest problems of the studios and platforms and like writers, they just have us and put us, and I'm speaking about me as a Latina immigrant, you know, on a box. And that's like the box where we are. And then, and then I think that that's, it's an obstacle because then, you know, then we don't have anywhere to go. <laughs> so, um, and it's, it's sad. And, 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 and I think that studios, they need to be, they need to acknowledge our voices um, they need to be inclusive, but they need to uh, acknowledge that we all come from different families and different communities. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the overlapping stories, the, you know, it just, which is where you really get real in the moment, you know, in terms of your expectations of what characters will and will not do. So Jackie, as a social entrepreneur, you are always looking at opportunity on the other side of a contrarian viewpoint. So, uh, you know, as you're hearing about voices and story development and characters and our perceptions of what really even intersectional storytelling is, what, how, what do you think? Well, I think that, um, you know, the ecosystem has changed over the years. You know, I take, for example, the, the big um, massive immigration that happened about 23 years ago, 20 to 25 years ago to the States, you know, so I think of, you know, through the lens of my culture, um, you know, in this ecosystem of, uh, for example, the Latino community, right, in this wave of new immigrants. And um, so when I think of intersectional storytelling, I think of not only, you know, the differences, you know, the, the gender, the, the upbringing, the, you know, the things that we're doing, but I also think of the multi-generational differences. Um, I have the privilege, um, and I always say, you know, first for me, first impact, and then money. And because of that, then, you know, everything else follows, right? And that goes back to what I read when I was a little girl of, you know, helping enough people get to their dreams. And what I have found is that intersectional storytelling allows people in, in various contexts, in various communities to elevate their voices and to feel proud and, you know, to have, you know, commonality to have you know an emotional connection to who they are like I remember and I feel kind of a little ashamed of this but I remember when I came to the states I was 14 I didn't speak a word of English and I wanted to be cool I wanted to blend in I wanted to be part of the narrative of you know my my environment and uh, shortly after I mean I just started discovering that my unique differences and the things that I brought to the table, this juxtaposition between, you know, the, the, the impact that you can make from, you know, using all the uniques of who you are 
intersected with a new ecosystem, you can actually, there's, there's always space for authenticity. There's always space for a story that is coming from the heart. There's always space for someone that is aligned and has congruency. And I didn't know that. I mean, I was a little bit, you know, like, I, I, I don't want to say ashamed, but, you know, it's like a lot of people were like looking down in our community and, I was like, I just want to blend in. I want to have the cool clothes. I want to have, I want to be cool like the, the rest of them. And I was almost ashamed of my story of where I came from. And then shortly, you know, after I started uncovering this beauty that was lying in my story that I didn't need to go to the depths of the ocean or do anything to find the authenticity and the congruency within my story and that it was okay for me to be authentic and to share. And um, because of that, because I allowed myself and I give myself the permission to, to have those moments of, you know, pure connection with other people, because I was, I decided to be authentic. I started getting a legion of people over the years saying, you know what? I got a story too. I, my story is worth it. And even if, if it's, a micro story within the story, that is also worth it, right? So over the last seven years, I have elevated over 300 Latinas in my various book series around the world in four continents, 20 countries. And I'm proud to say that a lot of people have come up to me and say, I want to be Latina, right? So do you feel proud of your heritage? Do you feel proud of your story? And if you don't, what can you do and how can you share your story in the most authentic way so that other people gravitate towards that story? And I think if we all find our own authenticity within our culture, within our upbringing, within our unique values and our talents, I think we can share a much bigger story, the story of the humankind, and realize that at the end of the day, we're all part of this world, we're all part of humanity, and what makes us different actually bonds us together, what makes us unique actually creates those, that intersection and that congruency so that we can do better things in our in our communities. And that's what I've been doing. I have 182 young ladies. They call, me, they call me Mama Jackie from my foundation. And I've seen their stories evolve. I've seen their stories and how, how proud they feel to be Latinas. And that's, that's my mission. You know, that we find our own unique, authentic voice and we find that emotional connection. But most importantly, we find the congruency in, in this uh, intersectional storytelling and understand that there's always a place for a beautiful heart that is ready to share a moment with the world. So we are all characters in our own story, which is very, you know, powerful to 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 think about what that is and um, and to be able to push that forward. Thank you for for, for that, um, Liliana. How about you in terms of character development and narrative story? And I mean, I I agree with everybody, right? I think, uh, and I'm, but I'm actually glad that Jane kind of touched upon this about, you know, yeah, we're doing better, right? And we are having, you know, inclusive stories, but I think we can do so much better even within our own communities, right? I know that there's an intersectionality within our own communities of, you know, Afro-Latinx, of, you know, LGBTQ disabilities, like you mentioned. So I think it is still time for us to listen as well to our own community, uh, because I think there's room to grow because there's there's space for all of our stories, right? And there, uh, there is a demand right now of, you know, inclusive storytelling and inclusive stories uh, because they do very well. And I think we've proven that um, over and over again. I think that uh, the demand is there. So uh, the, the thing is like, oh, you know, the demand is there, but the supply, maybe not. But that's something that we as you know, as a nonprofit organization wants to make sure like, no, there is, um, here they are, right? That's why we make sure that we showcase their work. That's why we want to make sure that we, you know, help advance their careers, put them into the right rooms, um, making sure that they are visible. Because I think that that is what uh, 
what we need to do is is make them visible right like what what are we lacking here that you guys need uh there is a supply because we have very talented communities of filmmakers and and storytellers across the board and i think right now everybody's a storyteller because of you know the streaming platforms because of the social media platforms because of you know all of that i think we're all able to tell our stories in our own way as well so Lilian, if I were to give you the mic right now, what <laughs> question do you have for our panelists? Um, how do you see the industry shifting, you know, after 2020, I guess, how do you think that this has impacted and, and where, do, where are we going from here? Are we saying like December, 2020 or it's yeah, yes, after, year, after, after, after this crazy year, yes. like we're still in 2020. Uh, Olga, how would you answer Liliana's question? Oh my God. Um, I don't know, but can you find someone to tell me? <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> can you tell me? Um, to be honest, I, I, I feel that this year has been a year of growth mm -hmm. um, for a lot of people. A year, and I, I echo Liliana what you said, or I think it was Jane, it's just where you are listening and learning. And I think that that is huge for everybody across the board, not just in the industry, um, uh, but across the board. But in the industry, I do think that because everybody's listening and learning, they are more aware of, of what they cannot do and what they should do and why are the changes that need to do uh, just because I do feel that 2020 has been a year where everybody's like, wait a minute, I don't need that. I need this. And, and it comes from like from the family um, up to, uh, you know, a whole like um, studio or platform that we hear that all these big companies are restructuring the whole way. And they, you can hear that they are getting more people uh, like diversity included. And, and then I feel it's just because of this year, it's been so, um, it's been a, a roller coaster of feelings in every single level for everybody. Um, so I do hope that that industry and the, like the platforms and the studios open doors uh, to the to diversity, open doors to new characters because we do need new characters. We cannot we cannot be what we cannot see, what we cannot show our like you know newer generation. So and us as producers, Jane, we need to push. We need to push, 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 and and elevate Liliana and and Jackie. However, we can elevate people that don't don't have a voice and don't have that microphone or don't have that uh, position of power. You know, we need to have more people that have our own thinking in positions of power. And I think that, that they're listening and, and, and they're opening more doors for to have more people, more women um, in positions of power. And hopefully there's a, a great 2021 for everybody with a lot of opportunities. We just now have a couple more minutes. So, you know, Jane, just your closing thoughts uh, to Liliana's question. Um, I think that, um, I think that, uh, I think we, we, we've got mixed challenges ahead of us for sure. Um, I think they will be a lot less made um, inevitably during 2021 and 2022 because what wasn't made in 2020 will sort of knock on to 2021 and 2022. But I think two things on top of that. One, I agree that actually this time of, of listening and consideration has made people think, actually, do I really need the same old, same old? Is there a different way of telling that? The second thing is, I think that many different voices have been allowed to be heard during 2020, and that's all to the good. Um, and I think those voices are, as people think, well, maybe I don't need that after all. We don't have to do that. That was halted in 2020. I do think those new voices will come through into 2021. The only thing I would really say, and um, I just think that it is absolutely imperative 
that in 2021 and moving forward from where we are now that we're kind to each other. Yeah. I think the toll on the mental health of everybody yeah. has been and continues to be enormous. But I think the toll on the mental health of those voices that often struggle to be heard because those voices are marginalized because for whatever reason, um, because of neurodiversity or because of fear or, or because the world hasn't so far welcomed those characters, um, I think the toll on them is even greater. And I think that anyone like myself who is in a position as a producer where you are looking after people as well as getting that work done, the emphasis on looking after has to be very, very strong in 2021. Well, that I, I wish we had more time. That is a great way to end this conversation with a sense of hope and optimism and knowing we have a lot of work to do and we need to take care of each other. We really do need to take care of each other. I agree with the point about the mental health. We all have to really take care of each other and, and, and Olga for those that we're bringing into the world as well for future generations that have yet to come. So I want to thank AT&T for teaming up with the Female Quotient to bring us this discussion to the AFI Fest. And I want to thank you, Jane and Olga and Jackie and Liliana for your the gratitude of your time today and um, look forward to in, you know continuing this conversation in any way that we can. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Rhonda. Thank you.